Okay, I think we are at time, so we should start so we can finish on time. So this is open source project management in the Drupal community, lessons from the multilingual team. There used to be cats in the title. I removed them because we don't have time to talk about cats. I'm um, Gabor Hoichi, and I led the multilingual initiative. So I just looked up the date of the announcement and celebrations, it was exactly 1,600 days ago that Dries Beitart announced me as the multilingual initiative lead. So that's kind of a long time, four and a half years. Um, so that's when he announced that I will lead the multilingual initiative, joining the configuration management initiative and the web services initiatives. And he also said in the post that I'm, I already have 15% time from Acquia to work on community projects, so I'm going to use that time as well as uh, my personal time to contribute to that. So. Uh, the first time I presented this talk, that I got feedback that, oh, you did all that stuff, but you were paid to work on this thing. No. So I had 15% community time from Acquia, and there were some lucky periods when I could work on critical issues for the multilingual team, and I'm very lucky that Acquia uh, values me so much to send me to events, so I can organize prints there, but other than that, I used uh, also a lot of my uh, free time to work on things. And... I learned a whole lot through these four and a half years. I made a lot of mistakes, and people on my team made a lot of mistakes. And I think we learned a lot from them. And the biggest mistake, or the lowest point of my initiative, was uh, 2012, May 22nd. Anybody has a guess on what happened on that day? One year into my initiative? Hmm? No, Views in Core Initiative was announced. That was the lowest point of my initiative because I was totally freaked out. I was like, Jesus Christ, views, views in core, they are like four times as big as any as the most popular multilingual module. They're going to crush Drupal. They're going to steal resources from everyone. It's going to be the worst nightmare ever. And I sent a very angry email to everyone in Drupal core leadership, including all the views in core people. And that included the bold section that said, in short, I cannot really tell at this point if I should be extremely happy for views being funded or be totally terri terrified that it makes it impossible for multilingual to reach its goals. So why did I do this? Uh, because I had a totally wrong mindset about how it's going to play out. Because I had this idea that Drupal is this fixed and very small pie that we all eat from and we use those same resources and if there's a bigger elephant in the room, they're gonna steal all of that from me and I'm not gonna have any, anything to deal with. So that's the wrong idea. So if you think about Drupal as this fixed pie, if you have a fixed mindset about how Drupal operates, then you're gonna fail and be freaked out of everything happening because then everybody's against you. Then you are like, I need to carve out this little section on the corner for myself and protect that with, with uh, my fiercest power. That's not how you approach uh, project management in a Drupal community. Because there's always all kinds of things that you need to do that people are waiting in the wings to do with you because they're interested in helping you out. And there's always more opportunities to grow the community that you can look for and attract more people to work with you. In fact, if you are not doing that, then your initiative is going to die because uh, people are going to go away, people are going to burn out, people are going to have family problems, etc. So you need to have a, a growth mindset. You need to think about your work in Drupal core as something that you need to grow and you need to, um, you need to nourish. So that was a very bad idea to, to do that. And I learned a lot from that and I read a lot of books and a lot of li literature on how to do this better. And... Uh, one of the things I figured out, I'm not a project manager by training, but I've been told that project managers look at this magic thing where they see what's the cost of this project, what's the scope of this project, and what's the time for this project, and then figure out what's the possible quality for this project to deliver. So you can increase the cost and then do something better, or you can decrease the scope and do something better, or you can increase the time and do something better, etc. So you can play with these variables and then see uh, which is the ideal combination for your uh, team. And for cost, I think for open source, I would replace that with people uh, because money is a scarce resource. 
Um, open source projects are not made equal. So some of them have money. So if you look at Android, for example, they are a group of companies working on the open source project, and they have, fun they have companies funding their people to work on Android, and they make this big push release, and then the whole world gets to see what's going on. Drupal does not work like that. So we don't have these developers in these big open plan offices working on Drupal core all day. We don't have that. So we tried getting some money into the project and get people funded. And that was uh, to some degree successful. Like using core raised uh, uh, 12.5K from the community and some, uh, some money from companies. And that helped fund people for a few months. And the configuration management initiative raised also um, money from different companies. But it's not scalable to the time required to work on Drupal 8 or to the time required to work on anything that, that spans a longer time. It's also not scalable if that, if that person burns out or if that person needs to go away or if that person has family issues, which happens regardless of money. So you always need to care for care for people who would not be paid for or try to attract those people who you cannot pay. So you need to figure out what makes people happy to work with you, what, what kind of value you can provide people so they work with you. And if you can provide value to people to work with you and, they're, and it's interesting for them, they are going to work with you. So I have this talk about Drupal initiatives, but I think a lot of the principles I'm talking about will be applicable inside your business or inside your church group or whatever you have locally, local community, if you do fishing, whatever. It doesn't matter. I think it's, it's going to be uh, applicable to that as well. There's been a lot of research in that, and one of the interesting books I read was a Drive from Dan Pink. And, he's, and he sets up a three-pronged three uh, system for this, and he says people need autonomy, mastery, and purpose to be motivated um, to work on something if they don't get money, or even if they get money, they would be more motivated to work on something if they have these three uh, things in their work. So let's start with purpose. So purpose means that you work on something and it makes a bigger contribution than you are, than you contribute to something bigger than yourself. And I think in a lot of ways that's evident in Drupal, but in a lot of ways we need to repeat that message so that people understand that. So one of the things that Dries said uh, on Tuesday, I stole this slide from Dries, is that there are uh, 3.1 billion people online, and since one in 40 sites are Drupal, if one person visits 40 different sites, it's very likely that they use Drupal somewhere. And that's pretty powerful if you think about it, that your work that you do is probably there somewhere and somebody used it. As for me, before I joined Acquia, I worked in Google Summer of Code, and um, and uh, I worked on localization tools for Drupal. And before that, I did my master's thesis at the university and worked on localization tools for Drupal 6. And when I, um, I defended my thesis, I got booed out of the room because I used PHP and MySQL. Not good at the master's thesis topic. It's like, is technology PHP and MySQL, not .NET or Java Beans or what? No. So I got almost literally booed out of the room by the people um, I was defending uh, with. And um, then, three years later, my university website switched to using multilingual Drupal. <laughs> and they still use multilingual Drupal, so I'm like, oh, that's nice. Um, so, um, so, so it gives you a sense of purpose that the work you're doing is making things better. And I uh, collected a lot of sites that use multilingual Drupal and make a difference and presented this list of sites at several events. So for example, the, um, the um, World Health Organization uses Drupal, um, multilingual Drupal, of course. These are all multilingual examples. UNESCO uses Drupal. The World Food Program uses Drupal. Amnesty International uses Drupal, multilingual. In fact, if you are following uh, Natalie Nahai, our keynote speaker yesterday, you may have seen this tweet from Natalie Nahai yesterday night. She tweeted, just supported this campaign by Amnesty International to help Syrian refugees. If you'd like to help too, you can do so here. So we helped Natalie support Syrian refugees in, in, um, to, to make their life better. That's kind of nice, I think. 
It's kind of nice. If you think about science, there's um, the CERN is using multilingual Drupal to present their findings. And if these are like two big examples for you, you're not so big of an organization as CERN or Amnesty International, whatever, you don't get that kind of donation, that kind of money. There's a lot of smaller organizations using Drupal as well. So this is a um, small program at Stanford for high school students to get them to work on interesting engineering projects. And they use multilingual Drupal as well. So I think the work that we do in the multilingual initiative, as much as it makes it better for, for the Amnesty Internationals and the CERNs, it makes it so much better for the small sites because it's all built in. It's much easier to click together. You don't need to understand all those modules. You can do it very fast. That I think it enables um, Drupal to reach even more people. So I think the, the, uh, the purpose of the multilingual initiative is to make Drupal more accessible to people around the globe and bring Drupal to more people around the globe. And I think if people understand this goal, then then it helps them have some feel they have a huge impact whatever they do in a multilingual initiative. I think whatever we do with images or videos or layouts, if people don't understand the text on the page, they can't use the tool, then it doesn't matter for them. So I think our work brings all of the rest of the features to the world because we make them appear in their own language that they understand. And then, of course, people have their own... own um, own um, motivations as well. They have their own projects, they have their own clients, they have their own pains in Drupal 7 they want to resolve. Um, those, those also drive them to get in. But I think this, this uh, bigger purpose um, helps a lot as well. So that's purpose. Let's talk about autonomy. Autonomy is controversial in Drupal because you go start, on, start work on something and then nobody cares about it, nobody. Then you post it and then it sits there for years and then you forget about it and then you don't even look at Drupal anymore and go elsewhere. So some people think that if we have um, a roadmap, a very detailed roadmap and a master plan and then we tell people what to do, then it will be great because they will be able to know what's going to be accepted and then they will be able to work on those things and it gets accepted and everybody's happy. That's not really how it works because that's how it works in your day job. You have a boss, they tell you what to do, you do that, you get money, and then you go home. If you have a free time job, you kind of want to do your own thing, you want to experiment with things, you want to learn new things. People don't really like being told exactly what to do. People don't bother if you have a framework for what, a bigger framework of things, but for specifically telling them what to do is not so good. And I have a great example from a totally different field for you uh, for that. So this is David Marquet. Uh, he graduated in 1981, top of his class from the U.S. Naval Academy, an institute renowned for developing leaders to serve the U.S. nation. And therefore, he joined the submarine force. And along his journey, one thing bothered him is this uh, leader-follower model in the Navy that leaders... Um, leaders um, have commands and then followers need to follow the commands and that's it. And that he didn't li like that. So he tried changing that, introducing a model of um, uh, that's different so that he can have thinking people on the ship. And he tried that as an engineering officer on the USS Will Rogers and then he totally failed. It didn't work. Uh, so he fell back at the leader follower model. That was good. That everybody knew that he he gave, he gave out commands. They were executed. That's fine. And then he was selected to uh, captain the USS Olympia, a nuclear powered attack submarine. And then he was learning for a year to learn all the features of the ship, so he knows what to do on the ship. And then two weeks before he started serving on the USS Olympia, he was diverted to a totally different ship, the USS Santa Fe, because the captain quit. And he had no idea about the features of the USS Santa Fe. It was a different build. He had no idea. So he had two weeks to prepare. So he went there, and then, um, and then he needed to lead the ship. Now, less than a month after he was there on the ship, there was a drill to simulate a fault with the reactor on the ship. And then he was supposed to provide the commands of what to do. So he was shouting commands that he believed to be right. And then the second officer repeated those commands, but nothing happened on the ship. And he was like, what the hell is going on? We're going to blow up. And nothing happened because the commands, uh, the commands he shouted did not apply to this ship. They didn't make sense. He was trained for a different ship, and uh, he didn't know this one. 
So that's kind of a bad thing to, a bad situation to be in if you are on a nuclear submarine. And that, that can cause problems. So he decided to try something else. So the leader follower model works like this. The captain says, submerge the ship. The subordinate says, submerge the ship IA, and, that, and then it's done. So he tried to push control down and say, OK, what do you think we should do? Ask an open-ended question. And then the subordinate says, I think we should submerge the ship. So then he tries to teach this um, intention-based system to the subordinate. So he asks, tell me you intend to do that. And then they say, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. And then all he needs to say is very well. So the problem with that, that's, uh, that sounds nice. So he can push control down. The problem with that is he cannot really know if the subordinate understands if, if, it's, if, um, if it's the right thing to do, if he's competent to do, if he's competent to decide if it's the right thing to do. So he decided to move this forward and build an assurance of competence into the system. So now the subordinate comes in and says, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. And then the captain says, what do you think I'm concerned about? See, he has no idea of the ship, so he cannot ask questions because he has no idea what he should be concerned about, right? What may be a problem with submerging the ship? And then the subordinate says, you're probably concerned about whether it's safe to do so. And he's like, OK, then convince me it's safe. And then the subordinate says, OK, I intend to submerge the ship. All crew are below decks. All hatches are shut. The ship is rigged for dive. And we've checked the bottom depth. Then he can say, very well. And then it can happen. So the previous one pushed down control, which makes him be able to go eat dinner or do something else. He, he does not need to be the one to make the decision. This one ensures that the person understands that it's possible to do. And then the final thing that's important to, in, to ensure is that it matches the mission that you are on, right? So it fits into the mission. It's not doing something else. So he uh, has one final suggestion for us. So when the subordinate says, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship, all crew are below decks, the hatches are shut, the ship is rigged for dive, and we've checked the bottom depth, he asks, is it the right thing to do? Does it match our mission? And then the subordinate says, yes, sir, our mission requires that we submerge now in order to something, something. So this ensures that they, that, uh, they tell you what they want to do. They understand that the requirements are met for what's to be done. And they understand it matches the mission. OK? So those three. And if you have a broad definition of the mission, then you don't need to make up all the details yourself. You can empower all the people that you work with because they can make these checks. And in fact, this is what we do now in the Drupal core issue queue. We have the beta evaluation forms, which have a criteria. You need to answer these questions. Is it the right thing to do now? Does it match the mission that we are in now? This is the kind of change we are in now. So this is the pattern that you can apply to all kinds of other things as well to push down control and ensure that it still matches the big plan. And the result is basically that when uh, inspection came in next year, they found they gave this um, submarine the highest grade ever seen in the US military because it was not a captain directing 134 puppets on the ship, but it was 135 thinking, acting, uh, taking initiative people who wanted to do the right thing. So it was a totally different setup because now you have a set of rules that people can work with and now you give them uh, enough um, autonomy to work within those rules, then they can use that autonomy and do fun things. So I think you need to agree on those goals and then leave room for autonomy. And then, of course, there's a lot of checks and balances in Drupal that you need to match. So for those things, we now documented the stakeholders, the main stakeholders in Drupal core. So who to talk to if you have this kind of change or that kind of change? What's the responsibility of maintainers, et cetera? So you can go there and talk to them. We have a system of cross-tagging issues. So you get feedback from the views team or the configuration team. These tags are pretty obscure. So you probably need someone to know those tags or look at the common tags page on Drupal.org that has some of them. What we did in the multilingual initiative as well is we used the sprint tag to keep track of current focus, which means that we can regularly review those issues and help people who pick whatever they wanted and help them evaluate if it fits the mission or if they're doing the right thing, but still keep them working on those things and just empower them to work on the things that they wanted to work on because it's their own, own initiative. They wanted to um, do those things. And for that, we've been holding public meetings to discuss these issues 
and we chose a very accessible text format, IRC, maybe not very accessible in terms of technology, but very accessible in terms of text format, because for a multilingual team, people would not be able to be on the phone or on video because they need to time to understand language. They often don't speak English that well, and they need to time to write language. They often don't write English as well either. And the meeting is also good to attract new people. So we often have new people come in. They see what we are doing. They see the activity going on. There are open meetings. So they see what's going on and what kind of things we are working on. And it's also good to reintegrate all people, people who've been there before but needed to go away. Um, so they come in and they see that things are still going on, that we took care of their things while they were away, and they are welcome as well. So I think that it's important that you have a format that's accessible. And it's also important to have reg regularity to these meetings because then people have a fixed time. And as, um, and as we heard in the keynote yesterday, they have a sense of belonging and a sense of stability. It's the same time, same place that they can go there and uh, meet the people that they work with. And then there's always people working on things that do not fit the mission. So you need to recognize if an issue is going off scope or towards a cliff, and it's, uh, it's one of the first uh, signs of um, burnout. If somebody goes off and works on something for months and without trying to consult people, so you need to recognize that and act on it as soon as possible. Keeping things on a sprint helps with that because you see what's going on, you see the updates to them, uh, because you can look at the issues on the sprint as a filtered list. And then go and ask the people, do you ask some, some of the other stakeholders if this direction is good or if it fits their mission of what they are working on and their initiative, et cetera. So that really helps get them people back from uh, bad situations. It also helps that, that they feel like you care for all those things that they are working on, even if they didn't ask you specifically to look at it. And then you need to recognize when somebody becomes unavailable for whatever reason. Maybe they burnt out or they have a family problem or they not even a problem, they're going to have a kid. Um, one of the things that's going to happen in the multilingual initiatives, I just had a kid born five months ago and I learned this week that three key members of the multilingual initiative are going to have a newborn in the next six months. Three key members. So they will become unavailable. So you need to recognize that and have uh, people to have people who can take that, take that work over, if at all possible. And one more thing about that is you need to praise people for working hard and you need to praise people for taking time off. They should take time off. They should not work all the time. It's good for them to take time off. If you have a system of this print system where you review issues and you can have other people on those issues, then it's totally fine for them to take time off. They are not single responsibility for anything. They can just go and do whatever they want. If you don't have that system and they go off and do whatever they want, you cannot do anything against it anyway. So you much better accept it, that they need to go off. You need to be okay with that, and when they come back, you need to, uh, you need to be open to that thing. It's like, yeah, they went off. People have all kinds of things in their life. So just accept that as a normal thing, and, um, and even encourage that when you see that people need to do that. So to uh, have multiple people work on something, one of the great tools is to delegate responsibility. So the first thing I did uh, I have on the initiative was to delegate responsibility because I figured it's, it's too huge a task to do myself. And I thought it's going to, um, going to scale to more people. But in fact, what turned out is not the scalability to more people, but that those people can t take ownership of those work, and they feel better about that, because now they have ownership of that work, and it's not me telling them what to do, but I'm delegating them that work. So initially, I thought I'm going to have three uh, sub-initiative leads, so to speak. Um, uh, Eric Stilstra, Jose Rajero, and Francesco Placella. Eric was working on localization updates. Jose Rajero was working on IETN in Drupal 7, and he was working on config translation, config schema in Drupal 8. And Francesco Placella was working on entity translation in 7, so was working on content translation in 8, and also the language subsystem. So that was my initial thinking. But then, of course, they are the same, they are people too. 
So they have their own life, they go away. So you always need to think about even more people that you can work with. And all of them had their, um, had their events in their life when they need to go away, sometimes for months, and then we needed to um, replace them. So the next important thing is to plan for successors. And the easiest to do that is if you cultivate small teams working around things. So if you pair people up at sprints, if you get people review each other's code, if you try to encourage further delegation from those people that you delegated to, et cetera, so that it helps uh, that somebody will be able to step in your place. Otherwise, you need to make all the decisions and otherwise you'll never go and eat dinner. So for me, one of the extreme examples of the delegation was uh, DrupalCon Austin. Um, so my wife had a severe health issue. She had internal bleeding, and she lost 2.5 liters of blood in one day. And if you are not in health matters, that's half of your blood. So she was in very bad condition. And that was at the time of Austin, and I wasn't traveling to Austin at all because I was taking care of my wife. And you would think that nothing multilingual will happen in Austin because I was not there, but that's not the case. Because we share a lot of responsibility presenting about things. We share a lot of responsibility leading sprints. We share a lot of responsibility leading the meetings online. So I, I can always have people to lean on when these things happen. Hopefully not going to happen anytime soon again. Um, so I can ask people to step in my place as well so I can deal with my own things. And what happened in Austin is people came together and sent us this photograph um, with hugs, with virtual hugs, when we had this difficult situation and did the multilingual sessions and the sprints and all of those things. <clears throat> so if you, if you are not required, then people will be able to step in your place. I think that's, the, that's a very key lesson. So as I've said, um, pairing people on issues help develop expertise because they will know the same, they will know similar things. They may have different viewpoints. They help each other moving things forward. One can review others' work, et cetera. And as I've just said, if you're not required to make decisions, then replacing you is easy because the others can do things. Like you don't need to be there and things will go on. And what helps getting all those people in that you didn't think will be there, what helps growing the pie, is if you recognize the wide variety of areas you need help in. So as Dries said in the keynote, if we do usability testing sooner, then we can do more things sooner. If we do fixing help text sooner, then we can involve uh, people sooner, et cetera. So that's one thing we did. Because, in, um, because uh, I don't have the date, but I think it was almost two years ago, we decided to do usability testing on the things we did because we did a lot of cool changes and we wanted to see how people work with that. So we got a lot of help from Boyan Summers, Dharmesh Mystery from Acquia and Lisa Rex. And those people, like uh, Dharmesh and Lisa, did not per, uh, participate in the initiative before or after. We asked them help with the usability testing and they helped them. They put in a lot of effort into helping us write the usability testing scripts um, suggested as techniques for testing, et cetera. And then we got people like Istvan Palots or, uh, Jan, or uh, Jobot Bobica in Serbia, I believe, who tested with the script people at their Drupal camps, and they never contributed to the initiative before or after either. So you can involve people who otherwise would not come much earlier and get very good feedback. And now we, and after this, we've had like four pages of feedback from usability testing and then we know where to put how we change the default language or what to change in the UI where you set up default languages. So if you do that early, you can involve people early and, uh, and get valuable feedback and grow your team. Um, then another thing we did is we really take it seriously to provide added value with radical transparency. So one of the things is we do a lot of presentations like this one. And we really like sharing them between each other. And even more so, we like sharing them widely. So one of the things we did is um, Amy and myself in Amsterdam did a workshop, a Drupal 8 multilingual workshop. And we planned out a demo site with sample content and uh, menus and views and stuff. And we decided to make this wholly open. 
So you have this distribution on drupal.org multilingual demo, and not just the distribution, we made the slides available for presentations, and uh, Amy created a handout document, it's like 30 something pages, it's a lot of, a lot of text, that is available for anyone to either walk through this workshop at home or present this at your company to teach people at your company about Drupal 8 Multilingual or present this at an event. And again, we got a lot of new contributors thanks to this because this was presented in Germany, was presented in India, was presented in Spain, it was translated to Spanish by people who never contributed otherwise to the, to the initiative. They translated the handout, the full handout to Spanish and the person translated it to, um, for the Indian event as well. So um, again, we got people contributing and, and providing value for the initiative who would, we never thought they would. We, don't, we didn't even know them. Uh, what helped in building the physical team is meeting and working in person. That always helps. So although this is a virtual team, we meet every week, uh, we still get a lot of value from meeting and working in person. And one of the things we did was at DrupalCon Denver, was quite a small conference. What we decided is uh, to do pre and post sprints before and after DrupalCon. Um, so we made, we made some news about it, and then the multilingual team got together, got sponsors, so we had a pre and post sprint. And then we heard the Views team did a pre, pre, pre sprint as well, but we didn't hear about that before. And then uh, later events, we got together. So the next big event was Drupal Dev Days Bar uh, Barcelona. And we decided to get together and do a pre-sprint before Drupal Dev Days Barcelona as well. So from a three-day event, it grew to a seven-day event. And now we did the sprint for four days, and then there was the event. So um, if the DrupalCon grew too long, it's our fault. So uh, Drupal Dev Days organizers and proposing organizers complain that it now costs too much because we grew it from three days to seven days. I'm sorry. But it provides really good opportunity for people to get together because when you have this opportunity to, this is from Drupal Dev Days Seged from uh, last year, uh, you have this opportunity to sit together with uh, high profile contributors like Alex Spot and Jesse Beach uh, down here, then for four days, you can sit down with them and work with them. You can learn what debugger they use, what kind of solutions they, that, how they search the issue queue, um, who they talk to when, when you ask them a question, all those things. And you can learn all the things from, uh, from top minds in the community. And they, um, and they go to Drupal Dev Days and you have like four days of uninterrupted time with them. It's pretty cool. Here you get here, there's sessions. They may or may not be available. Tomorrow's gonna be a sprint. Please come to the sprint. Uh, it's a good thing, but it's not enough to make big changes because it's one day. So if you did not have time before the con or after the con to work on something, if you sit down at the sprint, you sit down there, your dev environment is outdated, you now you update PHP, oh, now you update Apache, now you update Vagrant, now you update um, whatever. So you need to update the whole stack, and then you need to figure out now your Drupal checkout, now Wi-Fi is down, I cannot check out the Drupal version anymore, and now I need to figure out what to work on, and that issue was already taken, but they did not tag it, and all of those things, and by the time in the afternoon, um, you may not get to work on an issue. If you go to the mentor sprint, that's not what's going to happen to you. Go there, they're gonna help you have a much better experience, but it can happen to you. So um, if, a, if you are at a multi-day sprint, you can have all those problems in the morning of the first day, and for the rest of the event, you can dive down and do all the, all the crazy stuff. So I suggest you go to multi-day sprints. There's now extended sprints around DrupalCon. It's now, or it's now paid for by sponsors at DrupalCon. It's a lot of fun, so now it's all built into it. And the same for Drupal Dev Days. Um, yeah, so that was uh, autonomy. Now let's do mastery. So mastery is the kind of thing when you are learning an instrument on the weekends and you want to get better at it. And one of the people um, who uh, wanted to get better at it was Kathy Thais. So she was playing an instrument, again, DrupalCon Denver, um, and always improving, and playing great songs. And this was her second DrupalCon. First one was Chicago. And Chicago is, is her hometown, so she went back home every day, but in Denver, she decided to go and contribute. And she went to the sprint, and she's Drush didn't work. So she gathered a group of people to uh, fix Drush, and he set up a table, let's fix Drush together. And she helped resolve Drush problems for everyone except herself. 
then she needed to patch uh, Drush to uh, display error message differently so it's easier to figure out. So she patched it, and then she asked people at the sprint if she can present the patch and like present how it's done. And then they allowed her to do that. So she basically became an, an immediate um, success in mentoring in the Drupal community, like in half a day. Uh, and then we were very lucky in the multilingual initiative. As I've said, we've had the extended sprint, and we did not have a venue for the extended sprint after the conference. So we were sitting in the lobby of the hotel uh, working there, and then she just came there, and she's like, oh, you're working on stuff. And we're like, yes. And then she joined the multilingual team, and uh, the rest is basically history at this point. I think she instilled a lot of mentoring goodwill in the multilingual team. So tomorrow, if you come to the multilingual table, it will be very, very boring because there's going to be maybe two people there because all the multilingual people will be yellow shirts in the mentoring room because, because they are infected. Um, so what Kathy said is, I remember Sunday sitting with you all thinking this is just freaking amazing. So if you learn about these, if you want to learn more about uh, these things, David L. Marque has uh, turned the ship around, published, and Daniel Pink has Drive. Uh, the book called Drive published, and I'm not done yet because there is still scope and time. So this was all the people management, but they need to still hopefully deliver things that are within the scope and within the time that you need. And for that, I got a lot of inspiration from Shannon Vitas, who at DrupalCon London 2011 summer approached uh, Angie Byron. Uh, she had some great ideas on how to improve communication in the community and how to how to um, get better at this. And she said that her employer will be able to donate a little time. Now she spent a lot more time on this um, than she originally expected, I think. And she really inspired me in being a better communicator about the initiative. So again, the scope question can be resolved in part by agreeing on bigger goals and then leave room for autonomy because then you can check if that's still in the boundaries of the bigger goals. Things that we did to, um, to help us check that is we kept issues strictly on Drupal.org, so it's easier for us to communicate what's going on, what's, what's uh, happening, what are the issues that we are working on. And then we've been working on grooming this backlog so that we know what's in the issue queue. We know that there's these meta issues that break down to those 10 issues, and then they are those... 30 novice issues that we can give to people when they come in because there's always people coming in with all kinds of crazy things like I'm a UX, um, UX, I have experience UX testing or I'm a UI developer or I can write documentation for you. And if you know your backlog, then what, if it's not a high priority, you can still give it to them and work on them and, and get them work, uh, work on it. Um, and that would still be within your bounds and you get new contributors again. So one thing we built to so help solve this communication barrier and help show people what we are working on and help us do timely reviews of things so we can um, do things hopefully faster is rocket ship, which is a different display method for Drupal.org issues. There's a rocket ship project on Drupal.org. So this gathers issues from Drupal.org and presents them in a much more visual way. And we have this board for issues with the sprint tag that shows us what we are working on right now, what's to be committed, what's to be reviewed, what's to do, and the priority of them is colored, et cetera, so that we can focus on things and we can do them in a more timely manner. And the, all this data collection actually allowed us to have a lot more insight on who's working on the initiative. And we are, um, we are crediting everyone who posted comments on any issue on the initiative. So this includes people who reviewed user interfaces, wrote docs, uh, provided testing feedback, UI testing, whatever, had an idea. And this is not really the complete picture. The complete picture would be this one. So it's over 1,300 people uh, who worked on the initiative. And then there's the problem of trying to focus people on the things that are uh, actually at the time of the release cycle important to do. Because, of course, people want to work on their own things, but you'd like to direct them and help them work on the right things. So for that, I read, this is the best book. If the only thing you take away from this talk is you should read the book of these two nice people is um, 
Chip and Dan Heath, and the title is Switch, How to Make Change When Change is Hard. I'm pimping this book wherever I go. It's an amazing book. Switch, How to Make Change When Change is Hard. And they have examples for how to save species, how to get people with, uh, with how to help kids with cancer, take their medication, all kinds of great examples. Now I'm going to provide you with a pretty uh, banal example. Not, um, not very nice, but it's very good to illustrate the point I wanted to make. So they have an example of car wash loyalty. So let's say you run a car wash company and you want people to come back. You have a loyalty card and you're collecting uh, loyalty stamps on the card. So a car wash company did an experiment and did, two, and did A-B testing of two loyalty cards. And they had a loyalty card that had eight slots on them and another one that had 10 on them, but two were already stamped in. So the ones, were, uh, so the ones that had eight stamps, only 19% of people came back uh, and got a free car wash at the end when they were complete. So only 19%, only one-fifth. And for those who had 10, but two were already completed, 34% earned a free car wash, and they earned it sooner than the other ones. So that's the, what you've heard yesterday in the keynote. They call, um, Natalie called it the consistency principle. That if you feel you're already on a way somewhere, then you'll have a consistent behavior continuing on the road. So, what I, uh, so this inspired me very much because I wanted to inform people about the work we do and at the same time get more contributors. So first inform people about the work we do and, in, and, and show the people doing the work that this is all this great stuff, but there's still more work to do. So that's the kind of the car wash, stamped car wash uh, loyalty. So what I did is I wrote blog posts and the top part of the blog post is what you got is great new features, Drupal 8, hey, it works, kind of nice. And then the bottom part is uh, issues to work on. By the way, it doesn't actually work. Uh, here are the issues to fix. So you read all this stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Oh, it doesn't actually work yet. Uh, maybe I can help fix it. So, um, well, it does actually mostly work. So I, I didn't cheat with it. It, most, it actually mostly works. There are some small issues with it that you can help with. So I, um, so I, I tried inspiring people to get to know the new features and help fix them. So people who never contributed to the initiative, they wanted to learn what's going on. They came in and they got a cue to, oh, here, contribute. And then I did an inception of this uh, because I crossed out things that have already been done. So you already see, oh, it's already done. So those are issues that can be done. Mm. Uh, I only recognized this uh, last month when I presented this talk first. It's kind of crazy that I, that's an inception. So um, that you can do when you are into your project. You can say good things about a project, and then you can point out things that are not already done. And then later on, we needed people to actually use Drupal 8. So uh, my colleague XGM actually did this figure about the critical issues that we kept accumulating, but we kept fixing them. So we've been fixing them and finding new ones. And we only find new issues if people use it. We don't, we don't find new issues if people don't use it, so we need them to use it. So we need to show them that it's actually useful. So what I did is I set up a page with live multilingual sites, and I made screenshots of them, and I asked people to tweet me new links. So I'm adding new ones um, um, all the time. So these are like actual live multilingual Drupal 8 sites. So this both shows that we are getting there. It's a reinforcement for people on the initiative that they're, they're, they re, they are reaching their purpose, they make things happen. And it also helps people actually use it and get us bugs because we are interested in the bugs so we can fix them. Um, so I'm actually showing these positive examples so we get the bugs. And I made the front page of, this is Drupal 8 multilingual.org, a video for the front page that very, it's a two and a half minute video that summarizes the initiative so people understand what's going on and then they can dive in. So it's a very short time commitment for you to understand what's going on and then you can dive in and this, you see the sites under there and then the team under there with photographs of actual humans that are working on the initiative and smiling while doing it. Um, so how, when you do these things basically depends on the cycle of the release. So this is a rough graph of an idea of how we did the cycle. So we had feature development, API completion and release and the further you get down, the more you need people to use your stuff and the more you need to communicate all the things that are ready and all the things that you know are broken and you need to get people to work on them. So again, if you uh, wanna get a lot more 
um, inspiring ideas, you should definitely buy this book, Chip Heath and then Heath Switch. I am in the middle of rereading it right now, and, and I'm blown away again. So it's an amazing book. I think it's like the open source community management Bible because it sets out the the um, the notion that you want to do you want to get changes done, but you don't have you are not the boss. You don't have any control over people, and you want to do good things and how you do that. So, in summary, my initial problem was that I thought that uh, there's a fixed pie in Drupal, and I and if somebody else is working on something, they will chip away at my pie, and I will not be um, able to complete my mission. And in fact, I send the view steam an apology uh, five or six months later and thank them that it turned out to be totally opposite of what I thought. They helped us resolve things. They were in our issue queue resolving integration problems. And I was in their issue queue resolving integration problems as well. So we both helped each other uh, make our result better. And through the learning process that I had in this uh, release, um, it made me better in learning what makes it possible to, uh, to inspire people and work on things that make them a better people and work on good things um, to get Drupal to uh, more people on the globe. So if you are interested in being part of this amazing thing, then tomorrow we'll have a sprint. If you never sprinted before, there's mentors available and they will help you out. If you have sprinted before, then we'll try to set out as an area for multilingual, and you'll be able to um, join us there. That's it for my talk. Any questions or comments, ideas, concerns? Cool. <laughs> okay. So if no one else is going to say anything, I'll say anything. Um, so I uh, was involved in Drupal 8 since the beginning of where before there were initiatives, right? I worked at Acquia and Dries was trying to figure out how to make all this work. And I will say of all the initiatives and all the things that we tried, I just wanted to congratulate Gabor for being the total standout initiative lead who managed to not only foresee all the things that he would have to build around him to make this happen, but uh, you know, to build the infrastructure in place, to develop tools, to think how to work smarter rather than harder, things like rocket ship, things like the sprint tag, things like this that I've seen other initiatives be able to leverage to increase their efforts. So I just wanna give you personally a big round of applause for everything that you've given to the community. Thank you. That's it.